In this video, we'll do an exam review on optic nerve and uh, brain disorders. The last session was interrupted because of the technical issues. The audio was interrupted, so we stopped in the middle. We did different uh, cranial nerves related to the optic nerve, pure sensory, pure motor nerves, and then we were doing the mixed nerves, and we, 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 we missed the facial nerve and glossopharyngeal nerve, so that I will add it to the video, the last video, and you can watch it on that. We had to do the Bell's palsy and Ramsey-Hunt syndrome and the muscle supplied by the facial nerve. So all we did, did the motor and pure motor nerve and everything. And now today we are going to start with the, I see. So we are left with this facial nerve so today I skip it over and now we go to the optic pathway and optic nerve lesions. Each eye is divided into two halves, a temporal half and a nasal half. The temporal half fibers have the nasal visual field fibers and the nasal visual visual fibers have the temporal visual fibers. This temporal visual fiber and the nasal fibers, they pass backwards to the optic chiasma where the nasal fibers decussate from both sides, whereas temporal fibers don't decussate. So if there is a lesion of the optic nerve before the optic chiasma, so what type of lesion it would cause? It would cause complete blindness in the ipsilateral eye, in the same eye, with loss of light perception. We'll do the light perception later in the program. But if there is an incomplete lesion of this optic nerve before the optic chiasma, say for example that involves the temporal fiber that represents the nasal visual field, what type of lesion it would cause? It would cause blindness in the nasal visual field of this eye. So this is the right optic nerve. So if there is a interruption of the temporal fibers, so there will be ipsilateral nasal hemianopia like this. So the fibers, they decussate in the optic chiasma and cross over. So the fibers of the temporal side, the nasal visual field, they remain ipsilateral, but nasal fibers cross over and come over to the optic tract. So what happens if there is a lesion in the optic chiasma, both nasal fibers are decussating, they represent the temporal visual field. So that causes bitemporal hemianopia or that involves and causes blindness in the right side of the ref right eye and the left side of the left eye. So that, that's also known as heteronomous hemianopia, right? So when does it occur, the bitemporal hemianopia? So where is anatomically the optic chiasma? This is the pituitary gland. And where is it? It's in the cella trachea of the sphenoid bone. And optic chiasma is above the pituitary. And this pituitary is connected by two connections to this one. Above this is hypothalamus. Two tracts, one vascular and the other one is neural. The vascular tract is hypothalamohypophysial portal system of veins, like the portal system of the liver and they bring the release hormone from the hypothalamus to the anti-pituitary for pituitary hormone TSH, RH, ACTH, RH, LH, RH and FSH, RH. So all these and they also bring the prolactin inhibitory hormone whereas the posterior pituitary is connected to the hypothalamus through the neural tract hypothalamohypophysial tract. What type of hormone they bring? They bring the two hormones, oxytocin and vasopressin. Pituitary doesn't make them. They are only stored in the pituitary. They are made in the hypothalamus. What are the function of these two hormones? Because they're produced in the brain, in the hypothalamus. Before we discuss it, let me see that what happens here that this optic chiasma is here above the pituitary. So a tumor, pituitary tumor, like a growth hormone tumor, will interrupt the fibers, nasal fibers, which represents the temporal visual field of both eye. And that would cause this type of bitemporal hemianopia. So these two hormones, oxytocin and vasopressin. Vasopressin, other name is ADH. So what's the function of the ADH? ADH maintains the 
blood volume and blood pressure. How does it do that? ADH causes water reabsorption from the DCT and collecting duct. So in the apps, hyper or smaller and the blood volume will be reduced to less than 200 milliosmos. There is a condition also known as SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate ADH production. That's increased ADH that will cause more excessive water reabsorption kidney. So urine become less in amount and the blood volume and serum will become more in amount. So the osmolality of the body fluids will be decreased. Whereas the other hormone, the oxytocin, has different functions at different physiological states of the body. Normally, oxytocin causes at puberty development of the breast, the ductal development of the breast. But at the time of labor, it causes uterine contraction by increasing calcium in the myometrium and that causes uterine contraction at the time of labor and also after the labor, it prevents bleeding. It's also involved in milk ejection at the time of lactation. And how does it do the milk ejection? Suckling baby, when he suckles the nipples, it stimulates the mechanoreceptors. These mechanoreceptors stimulate and produce the oxytocin from the pituitary. And that oxytocin acts on the myoepithelial cells of the breast, causing contraction, causing milk ejection. So oxytocin has nothing to do with milk production, but it causes milk ejection. Whereas if you see here, suckling causes a stimulation of mechanoreceptor and it also stimulates the production of prolactin. Dopamine is inhibitory to the prolactin. So this mechanostimulation causes prolactin production from the pituitary and that acts on the milk gland of the pituitary and produces milk synthesis by combining casein and lactalbumin. So what's important about the prolactin is that prolactin is also involved in the LH surge. So if there is an excess prolactin, hyperprolactinemia, or pituitary adenoma producing excessive prolactin, <coughs> that inhibits the ovulation because excess prolactin causes or inhibits the LH surge and LH surge is required for ovulation. If excess amounts of prolactin is present, it causes an evolutory cycle that causes infertility. So prol excess prolactin is an important cause of infertility. Now let's go back to the optic tract. So what type of fiber this optic tract starts from after the optic chiasma and then end up in the lateral geniculate body. Lateral geniculate body is a part of the thalamus and the fibers here are the temporal fiber from if in the right optic tract, temporal fiber representing the nasal visual field and the nasal fibers of the left eye which represent temporal visual fields of the left eye. So a lesion of the optic tract, what it will cause? It will cause blindness in the opposite half of both eyes. So the right optic tract lesion will cause blindness in the left side of both eyes here. This is right optic tract lesion that causes blindness in the left side of both eyes. This is known as contralateral yeah, on the left side of both eyes. So this is known as homonymous hemianopia, contralateral homonymous hemianopia. So a lesion of the optic chiasma caused by temporal hemianopia, that is heteronomous. But this one is homonymous. Left side of both eyes get a blindness in a lesion of the optic tract and the optic tract lesion. This is a blindness in the left side of both eyes. So this is a lesion in the right optic tract. And this one here, blindness in the right side of both eyes. So this is a lesion in the left optic tract that cause right-sided blindness, homonymous hemianopia, and this one, which cause right-side optic tract lesion, homonymous hemianopia. <coughs> Let's move on further. Now, contents, connections of the optic nerve. So the optic nerve, main optic nerve passes through geniculocalcrine tract to the occipital cortex, visual cortex area 17, the second connection is to the midbrain from the lateral geniculate body to the petectum and tectum in the midbrain and third one to the hypothalamus that controls the hormones, the emotions, circadian rhythm and sleep-wake cycle. 
let's discuss this pupillary light reflex so the pupillary light reflex when you throw the light on the eye it causes pupillary constriction so this is pupillary light reflex it has two arms a sensory or afferent that is carried by the optic nerve and then this optic nerve is connected to the midbrain and from the midbrain it's connect a connection has is connected bilaterally to the to where to the edinger westphal nucleus of the third nerve and that carries the motor fibers referent to the back to the eye to cause pupillary constriction so this pupillary constriction is bilateral because here in the midbrain the connection is bilateral to both the oculomotor nerve to cause pupillary constriction so this constriction of the other eye because the light was thrown in one eye so the other eye that has pupillary constriction with that is known as consensual light reflex right so pupillary light reflex light thrown here optic nerve carries as a sensory to the midbrain to the to bilaterally to the edinger westphal nucleus and then through the oculonotor nerve passing through the ciliary ganglion to the pupillary constrictors causing pupillary constriction in both eyes so this is the normal pupillary light reflex we'll do the abnormal pupillary light reflex later on in the program in the show what about pupillary dilator pupillary dilator the radial fibers and uh, they are supplied by the cervical sympathetic ganglia they cause flight and fright reactions so this is how pupillary constriction and dilatation occurs there is no pupillary light reaction i earlier told you that this optic nerve section before the optic chiasma will cause absent light reflex because here if it's disconnected disconnection here the disconnection to the midbrain is lost that causes loss of pupillary light reflex in a lesion that involves the pre-chiasmal part of the optic nerve whereas the lesion okay one more thing whereas the lesion that occurs after that like occipital lobe lesion in that case the pupillary light reflex is present in macular lesion now we go to the fundoscopy and ophthalmoscopy in the ophthalmoscopy we'll do normal findings and abnormal findings in the normal findings we will do the optic disc macula lutea fovea centralis and we'll discuss the neuroretinal rim <clears throat> where is an abnormal ophthalmoscopic finding we'll do the optic disc swelling cupping we'll do papilledema its the stages clinical features lab investigations of the papilledema we'll also do pseudo papilledema pseudo tumor cerebri and hypertensive and diabetic retinopathy so let's just start with the normal finding in ophthalmoscopy this is a line passing through the center of the eye about 4 mm to the nasal side of this is the optic disc or optic cup along with the neuroretinal rim and on the other side same distance is macula lutea and fovea centralis this is macula lutea in the center is fovea centralis and surrounding that is the bigger circle macula lutea on this side is a white circle like sun in the sky is the optic cup and it is surrounded by a bigger circle that's known as neuro retinal rim and you see the blood vessels over the optic disc but this part macula doesn't have a blood supply lying over it no blood vessels over here and blood vessels over the optic cup fovea centralis what does it contain it contains the <clears throat> cones only no rods it's rods free only cones and cones that concern with bright light 
daytime light, sharp vision, whereas macula contains the exons of the ganglion cell layers of the retina. And here on the other side, optic disc. How many parts of optic disc? And these, the so importance of the foveal cone is that each foveal cone, see these blue, red, and green are cones, and in the fovea, the, each cone is connected to the, each one is connected to single ganglion. And these in between are the rods here. And this first layer is pigmentary epithelium. And more than 50% fibers of the optic nerve are formed by the ganglion cell layer. Now, optic disc has two parts, optic cup and a neuroretinal rim. The smaller circle in the middle, yellow one is optic cup. It doesn't have photoreceptor. It's a blind spot. Whereas surrounding that is a bigger circle, neuroretinal rim. So what are the features of the neuroretinal rim is that this rim is widest inferiorly here than <coughs> superiorly than nasally, and the rim is thinnest temporally. So what's optic cupping? Cupping is enlargement of the optic cup. Optic cup enlarges, the rim atrophies, so it gets blindness. You see here, so normal CD ratio for the cup is 0 0.3 CD ratio. Whereas when cup enlarges, the CD ratio increases. See here it's 0 0.6, the cup enlarging, and here the cup completely occupying the optic disc area, and the neuroretinal rim has disappeared as atrophied. Right, and it's the CD ratio is 0 0.95 compared to the normal of 0 0.3. But the cup CD ratio in a, is, uh, the disc size may vary, may be small or large. In a small disc, the CD ratio of 0 0.3 may be abnormal. But in a large disc, even bigger than this 0 0.6 may be <coughs> normal. So we did the CD ratio, maximum neuroretinal rim is widest here, inferiorly, then superiorly, then nasally, and thinnest inferiorly. So what happens when there is optic cupping? See here, optic disc enlargement cupping occurring. So features, let me see here, the optic enlargement, what are the features that in the normal disc, <coughs> the blood vessels are almost in the scent here. But the cup in, enlarges here, enlarging. You see the blood vessel moving to a side and here to this side completely. And they move medially towards the nasal side. This is known as nasalization of the blood vessels. These arterial and venules, they move nasally. So we can say that this is the nasal side and this is the temporal side. And there is a notch in the, in the cup. Uh, not clear here, I show you here. See that? This is a notch here, cupping increasing, the neuroretinal rim decreasing in size. This is causing the blindness here. Okay, now we come to the, and then we also have Splinter hemorrhage is here when there is cupping and um, this features in the neuroretinal rim that it atrophies. So there are four or five features. Enlargement compared with the other side, compared with the old photograph. Okay, nasalization of CRA and CRV as the cup enlarges. This is here, the notching is very clear. Let me enlarge it. You see the notching here, neuroretinal rim notching because of the enlargement. And then we go to the, there are a splinter hemorrhages. So these are the features of, uh, in the neuroretinal rim and when the optic cup enlarges and it is cupping. So the difference between the physiologic cupping and glucomatous cupping is that this, 
as a stationary compared to the previous old photograph, compare it with the other side. Whereas glaucomatous cupping is very quick, fast. Okay. And now we go to the optic disc swelling and papilledema. The unilateral optic disc swelling, where in papilledema, the optic disc swelling is bilateral. And number two, there is increased intracranial pressure. So unilateral optic disc swelling and a bilateral swelling in papilledema. That's the difference. And what happens in papilledema? Both sides, both this swell because of the pressure from above, from increased intracranial pressure. So what's a normal pressure, intracranial pressure? The normal pressure is about 7 to 15 millimeters of mercury and at a pressure of more than 25, the alertness decreases and if the pressure is more than between 40 to 50 millimeters of mercury, the cerebral perfusion decreases. That leads to loss of consciousness and how intracranial pressure is measured definitely by transducer placed in the brain and how to decrease intracranial pressure a catheter surgically inserted into the lateral ventricles to drain the CSF. So the features in the papilledema may be acute state of papilledema and chronic. In acute state of papilledema there are hemorrhages, exudates and venous engorgement, cotton wool exudates, hyperemia. In acute stages if there is acutely developing papilledema the margins become blurred. Blurring and elevation of the optic margins and enlargement of the blind spot. So acute papilledema causes central visual loss. Otherwise, the chronic one doesn't. It causes peripheral visual loss. So what happens in chronic at different stages? First state is that there is an incomplete C-shaped halo around the optic disc. C-shape is incomplete at temporal border. And uh, there is obscurations of the nasal border. Okay? So this is in the first stage. Stage 2, the C-shaped halo, the gray halo, is complete. It also covers the temporal area. There is nasal elevation, obscuration, and temporal is obscuration as well. So it's in the chronic stage, in the stage 1, C-shaped incomplete halo at the temporal side and in this, uh, with the nasal border obscurations and in the second stage the C-shaped halo becomes complete also covering the temporal border and there is temporal excuration as well elevation then stage 3 elevation of these borders and there is optimal head elevation enlargement and at the disc margins there may be partial obscuration of the blood vessel leaving the disc this is in the stage 3 along with the other features of stage 1 and 2 and then in stage 4 there is definite obscuration of at least one border leaving the optic disc here. Stage 3, all these features plus partial obscuration of one or more blood vessels and stage 4, complete obscuration of one blood vessel leaving the optic disc. And then stage 5, dome-shaped elevation of the optic nerve head here. Dome-shaped elevation in stage 5 and see this beautiful, this is known as star macula and this occurs in Neurotinitis in cat scratch, but it may also occur in papilledema and diabetic and hypertensive retinopathy. Star penis of macula is due to leakage of lipid. These are the four stages of the papilledema. Stage 1, incomplete c shape incomplete C-shaped halo, temporal side normal. But in stage 2, the C-shaped gray halo is complete also occurring temporal trial and that's there is obscuration of the temporal side. Stage 3, there is obscurations of the blood vessels leaving the optic disc here. Yeah. Partial obscuration. The state for complete obscuration of at least one blood vessel leaving this this is optic disc margin here, leaving that. And then we have star appearance. There are not clinical features of the papilledema. It may be asymptomatic or may have headache, peripheral loss of vision. It may cause tunnel vision. So what about the disorders causing tunnel visions? Like this, this tunnel vision here, and maybe pigmentary degeneration of the retina. So this is the first layer. It causes the pigmentary degeneration of the retina. Also causes tunnel vision. And also the drugs, antipsychotic and hallucinogenic drug, lithium and especially thyroidism may also cause tunnel vision. Okay, we have clinical features. Tunnel vision, the dim vision, disturbed vision, 
decrease color volume. All these features emit papillary edema. But remember, acute papillary edema, there is central loss of vision. Central loss of vision is a feature of optic neuritis, whereas papillary edema causes normally tunnel vision. Now, causes of papillary edema, trauma, tumor, infection, increase CSF production, decrease CSF absorption. Which vitamin axis causes papillary edema? It's vitamin A axis that causes papillary edema. Vitamin B12 deficiency causes papillary edema. In which antibiotics, tetracycline may cause it. And I've already told that lithium and thyroidism may also cause papillary edema. So investigations in the papillary edema. Next topic, lumbar puncture. If there is a space occupying the unit, lumbar puncture should not be done because it may cause brain herniation. Ultrasound. B scan, bright scan to detect drusen. We'll discuss drusen later because that occur in AMD, adult macular degeneration. Fluorescent angiography, then fundus atophilurance. We'll discuss it now. And optical coherence tomography. So we discuss B scan, discuss LP, B scan for drusen. Fluorescent angiography tells you the extent of the vascular involvement. It is also effective in diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration. And a contraindication to fluorescence is hypersensitivity, MRI and CD. MRI, magnetic resonance, venogram, MRI are very important because they detect papillary edema before it's visible in ophthalmoscopy. So what are the MRI features in papillary edema? Number one, there is flattening of the posterior sclera, widening of the sheet, Torticity of the optic nerves. So these are the features that the flattening of the posterior sclera already and the protrusion of the optic disc had torticity of the optic nerve, widening of the optic nerve sheet. These are the features that you see from MRI before it detects any changes on direct fundoscopy or ophthalmoscopy. And high resolution MRI may differentiate papillary edema from other neuropathies. And next is fundus autophilaris. What is this? Fundus autophilaris is a non-invasive procedure that detects the cellular products in descent disorders. This is autophilaris. That lipofusion is extruded out and it is detected by fundus autofluorescence. Then comes the optical coherence tomography. It determines the structural damage. It detects the thickening of the retinal nerve fiber layer, RNFL. How is the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness in papillary edema? Yeah, the thickness is increased. Retinal nerve fiber layer thickness is increased in papillary edema, whereas it's decreased in the neuritis or other conditions. So why is it increased in papillary edema? The retinal nerve fiber layer is increased in papillary edema because of the edema of the axonal of the ganglion cell layer, axonal edema, and thinning due to atrophy in other conditions. OCT can also be very useful in AMD. In AMD also we can have some increase in retinal nerve fiber thickness layer and it also detects OCT, tomography, also detects glaucoma, retinal detachment, diabetic retinopathy. So these can be detected by OCT. Then there's the Heidelberg retinal tomography but for 3D. Nerve fiber analyzer measures also retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. Now we have to compare this papillary edema with the pseudo papillary edema and pseudo tumor cerebri. So what happens in papillary edema with bilateral optic disc swelling with increased intracranial pressure. But with pseudo papillary edema there is bilateral optic disc swelling without increase in intracranial pressure. Both optic discs are swelling in pseudo papillary edema but the in intracranial pressure is normal. And what condition is that? That's AMD. See this is adult macular degeneration. We have tricin here which are detected on B scan. See they are fluorescent hyperlucent, calcified, highline bodies from the cells and see this very white, chalky white optic cup, clear margins. But in papillary edema, the optic disc is blurred. It's raised over the surface. The margins are not clear. But in pseudopapillary edema, there are clear margins and optic disc is white, whereas it's blurred in 
papilledema compared to pseudopapilledema. And this one, Drosin, where does it occur? It's tested in the macula, scattered all over, but it occurs in non exudative form of AMD, which is more common. That occurs in 85% of cases. So this is pseudopapilledema. This is Drosin here, and this is blurred margin, optic cupping, so everything of that papilledema has. So that's the difference between the pseudopapilledema and papilledema. Then we come to the pseudotumor cerebri. So what happens in pseudotumor cerebri? Pseudotumor cerebri, there is bilateral optic swelling also and uh, increased intracranial pressure also. Both conditions meet with papilledema. So bilateral optic swelling with increased intracranial pressure. Its other name is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. But the CSF is normal. Pressure is more but there is no other abnormality in CSF except that CSF pressure is increased. So that's serotonin cerebri. This occurs in young obese female and it may occur due to poor absorption of CSF. But there are certain drugs that may cause it. Vitamin A toxicity, tetracycline antibiotic, phenothiazines may also cause pseudotumor cerebri. Steroid vitrol may also cause in quinolones, nalidexic acid. The treatment is acetazolamide for the pseudotumor cerebri that decreases the CSF production and reduce weight, reduce salt intake and for the non-responders it's a shunt to be placed there. So we did the papilledema, pseudopapilledema compared with this is with bilateral optic swelling without increasing in rise in intracranial pressure. Pseudotumor cerebri, that one here, with increased intracranial pressure but CSF is normal. Then we come to the hypertensive and diabetic retinopathy. Let's use the hypertensive retinopathy. There we see flame-shaped hemorrhage, the exudate, soft exudate, and hard cotton wool exudate. Soft exudates are due to infarction of the cells, and hard exudates are due to leakage of the lipids. They occur in hypertensive retinopathy. There are four stages, but before that, we discuss because. It's in malignant hypertension, if there is bleeding, then the blood pressure should not be reduced precipitously because otherwise it will cause optic disc infarction because of hypoperfusion. So that's important point. And then classification, there are four stages. In stage one, two, three, four. In stage four, there occur papilledema along with the features of all the stage three. And what happened in is stage one, mild, moderate, severe. Stage one, microorganisms will be seen. Very few changes micro. Stage two, moderate, in which you see microorganism and dot block. And stage three is severe with hemorrhages and cotton wool exudates. And in stage four, we have papilledema here, all things. Flame shaped hemorrhages, hard exudate, cotton wool, soft exudate, and papilledema. All the features of papilledema is stage four. The vascular changes in different stages of hypertensive retinopathy. The atherosclerosis, okay, here it is. Atherosclerosis causes arterial wall injury, vasospasm, thickening of the media, and damage to the intima. So the Arteriole, this is looked empty, and venule is the, the arteriole and vein are in a common sheet. Arteriole is above the venule. So when it gets thickened, it presses on the venule. So the venule looks like detached from distal one detached from the proximal part. So in different stages of hypertensive retinopathy, these vascular changes occur. So in a stage one, narrowing, arteriolar narrowing, stage two, AV nipping, stage three there, it looks like detached in stage four also detached. And copper wiring in stage three and silver wiring of the blood vessel. See this copper wiring, the last stage. This is due to increased arteriolar light reflex. Then we go to the diabetic retinopathy. 
डायबिटिक प्रोटोनोपैथी प्रोलिफरेटिव एंड नॉन प्रोलिफरेटिव प्रोलिफरेटिव अकर ड्यू टू प्रोलिफरेशन ऑफ द ब्लड वेसेस द लास्ट स्टेज एंड व्हेन एवर द रेटिनल इस्कीमिया अकर इट प्रोड्यूसेस वीईजीएफ वैस्कुलर एंड एथेलियल ग्रोथ फैक्टर व्हाट डज इट कॉज द वैस्कुलर एंड एथेलियल ग्रोथ फैक्टर कॉजेस न्यू वैस्कुलराइजेशन production of new blood vessels to perfuse the non perfuse area but these blood vessels are abnormal thin they bleed they rupture they bleed fibers the scarring occur and that scarring decreases the vision causes visual loss so this is what is the fourth stage i described before of us and in three stages stage 1 mild stage microorganism stage 2 moderate microorganism and blood that dot hemorrhages in stage 3 diabetic retinopathy is 4 to 1 rule 4 is microorganism and hemorrhages in all the four quadrants 2 2 is the venous bleeding venous bleeding in at least two quadrants and what's venous bleeding venous bleeding is irregular constrictions and dilatation in the venule and this occurs in uncontrolled diabetes and is a bad feature it may cause a stroke patient may have a stroke so venous bleeding in two the last part of 4 to 1 is irma that's intraretinal microvascular abnormalities in at least one quadrant so these intravascular blood vessels abnormal blood vessels they are to perfuse the non perfused areas they are shunt capillaries for the non perfusion area in diabetic retinopathy and this is fourth stage proliferative i already discussed due to retinal ischemia producing vgf that causes neovascularization then fluorescent angiography determines the degree of ischemia in diabetic retinopathy so i already explained what ischemic retina produces vgf that causes increased permeability swelling edema and increase in visual loss then we can how do you control the diabetic retinopathy by controlling the blood sugar blood pressure and cholesterol the a and c that is 5 6 7 8 if it's 5 then it's blood sugar is 97 mg per 100 ml it's 6 126 it's 7 is 1 so between 5 and 6 6 and 7 and 7 and 8 there is a difference of 30 mg right on blood sugar and between 5 and 6 and 6 and 7 there are 10 point between 5 and 6 so at 5.1 the blood sugar will be 100 similarly you go up and you can calculate how much is the blood sugar if it's 5.9 so it should be 123 so glycemic control then we have insulin how much insulin is given in different patients at different blood sugar level what type of insulin they are this is what cardiolene is the as the plate you and this is the regular one which is clear and to those who are resistant to insulin their dose is exceptionally more and it's 1 to 2 units per kg per day you know we is overweight patient may be given 200 to 300 units a day but normally you don't give an insulin up to 140 because how much in one unit of insulin reduces the blood sugar one unit of insulin reduces about 25 to 30 mg of blood sugar so if the blood sugar is 170 the patient will be given one unit for 200 the patient will be given two units of insulin so the 300 so minus 150 it's 150 extra so six units for the 300 and if the patient has 400 then minus 150 it's 250 so it's 10 units are given then how many patient develop retinopathy 25% in 5 years and hun- almost 100% in 20 years they develop retinopathy and most common complication is retinal detachment and visual loss vitreous hemorrhages retinal detachment and glaucoma and the drug treatment of course control of diabetes and anti vgf drug anti vascular and arterial growth factor drug they are monoclonal antibodies examples are pegaptinib aflibercept and ranibizumab it may be given intravitreously so what are the effects of anti vgf drug that they regresses the new vascularization 
regresses the macular edema and decreases the visual loss. Other treatment is lasers that also decreases, decreases neovascularization, decreases edema, clears hemorrhage and decreases the visual loss. So these are the features here with the laser surgery treatment, with the anti-VEGF treatment for diabetic retinopathy. But this laser treatment is not effective in advanced cases of diabetic retinopathy. So what to do with severe macropathy? Steroid eye implants are given in severe diabetic maculopathy when laser doesn't work. And eye surgery to remove any clot, scar tissues, vitrectomy is also helpful. So which drug prevents or slows down the diabetic retinopathy? It's metformin. Metformin slows down the diabetic retinopathy. It's a bigoanide. And how does it act? It increases the activity of AMP kinase that inhibits the gluconeogenesis because gluconeogenesis increases the blood sugar. So once it stimulates the AMP kinase that inhibits gluconeogenesis. Metformin decreases the GI absorption of glucose. Metformin decreases glucagon production. Glucagon is hyperglycemic by increasing cyclic AMP. Insulin is hypoglycemic. Glucagon is hyperglycemic. Metformin also increases the peripheral utilization of glucose. It increases the entry of glucose into the cell, but it does not have an effect on pancreas to increase the insulin production. And how much metformin reduces the blood sugar? It lowers the A1C by 1.5% at maximum dose. So at 7, it brings you to 5.5. Diabetic retinopathy. How common is the blindness in diabetes? Diabetes is the leading cause of blindness and it's about 25 times more common in diabetics than in non-diabetics. Non so the legally blind are 25 times more in diabetic and retinopathy occurs in almost all cases. What's the best predictor of the development of retinopathy? the duration of diabetes and the control of hyperglycemia. Glycemic and blood pressure control delays the retinopathy. How many people develop retinopathy and when? Almost all patients with non-proliferative diabetes mellitus develop retinopathy in 20 years and 25% in 5 years. So we end up here for today. Uh, if somebody is interested in any question, they can join the stream yard let me see if there are anybody in the stream yard and uh, right okay there is a link on the top of this youtube you see you can click that link to get in and have a discussion okay let's do that Okay, let's see if somebody is there to ask a question on this. Papilledema, pseudopapilledema, pseudotumor cerebri, neuroretinal rim, optic disc cupping, all these features, diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy, we did everything, all the stages of hypertensive retinopathy and diabetic retinopathy, important features in them so okay let's repeat before we go what did we do let me see so today let me go back what we did was that we started with the optic nerve features let's see with this one we did earlier okay so this is the optic nerve we started here each eye divided into two halves right and left temporal and the nasal and the temporal fibers carry the nasal visual field and the nasal the temporal visual field and then the this passes backwards to the optic chasma where nasal fibers they decussate that represents the temporal visual field so a lesion here at optic chasma will cause bitemporal hemianopia and lean the right side of the right eye and the left side of the left eye or heteronomous hemianopia. 
Then in the optic tract, we did said that a, a lesion in the optic tract uh, will cause blindness in the opposite half of both eyes. So a lesion of the right optic tract causes blindness in the left side of both eyes. Homonymous immunopia. So we did up to here and we, we, we didn't go beyond this. So a lesion over because these fibers are from the right eye, temporal fiber, which is nasal visual field, and the left eye, nasal fiber, temporal visual field. So the lesion will cause bitemporal because all this is the temporal fibers here in the optic nerve. <coughs> then we did the lesion in the optic nerve before optic chasma, complete blindness in this eye and an incomplete lesion of the optic nerve before the optic chasma will cause blindness in the nasal half of the right eye or the same eye. <coughs> so here. So these are lesions and then we did the, what we did, the optic chasma lesion by temporal hemianopia due to a tumor of the pituitary, different hormones produced from the pituitary and in them we discussed the neural hormones produced by the hypothalamus, oxytocin and vasopressin in full detail and then like SIADH and osmolality of the urine in these two conditions and the body fluids and then we discussed this, the oxytocin function in milk ejection and prolactin function in milk production from the glandular tissues of the breast. Then we passed on here that important cause is hyperprolactinemia or the pituitary tumor producing prolactin important cause of infertility because it causes, it prevents the LH surge and LH luteinizing hormone surge inhibits the ovulation. So a pituitary adenoma producing prolactin may cause infertility. And then we did the optic tract. We uh, I already told about optic tract lesions. The right optic tract lesion causing left side blindness in both eyes. Uh, that is uh, homonymous immunopia. And in the left optic tract lesion it called right sided blindness. The optic chasmal lesion caused Heteronomous hemianopia. Okay, right side of one eye and left side of the left eye. That was it. And then we did the connections of the optic nerve to the main connection to the visual cortex, area 17, and then to the one connection to the midbrain. And this one is concerned with the pupillary light reflex. <coughs> and we discussed the pupillary light reflex that is. And this is the function over here by two arms, the optic nerve being the sensory and the motor by the ocular motor nerve for the um, pupillary constriction or the light reflex. And it also constricts the other pupil, which is known as consensual light reflex, because the connection from the midbrain to the ringer westfall nucleus is bilateral here. <clears throat> so we did, the, and then we did a, People dilators are supplied by the people constrictors are supplied by this oculomotor nerve, but pupillary reflex complete by the optic and oculomotor, sensory and motor, but pupillary dilators are supplied by the cervical sympathetic ganglion. <coughs> then we did. So there is no light reflex if there is a lesion before the optic chasma optic nerve lesion because everything is gone. But a lesion after, we didn't discuss that, that lesion after because we couldn't reach that point. Then we, we did the ophthalmoscopy, normal findings in optic disc, macula fovea and neuroretinal rim. And then we did the abnormal ophthalmoscopic feature and we discussed optic disc and papilledema in detail with the stages of papilledema, clinical features and lab features. Then we compared the papilledema with the pseudopapilledema and pseudotumor cerebri. And in the end, we did the hypertensive and the diabetic retinopathy. So these were the features here of the 
ophthalmoscopy here normal the macular letia and the optic disc and in detail we discuss the neuroretinal rim which atrophies if there is optic cupping right and we discuss the different features of the neuroretinal rim when there is cupping and the normal CD ratio we discuss this is the normal CD ratio 0 0.3 and when the optic cupping occurs it is it's 0 0.95 and when there is optic cupping, these blood vessels move medially towards the nasal size. So this is known as nasalization. There is a notch there and there are uh, splinter hemorrhages in the, uh, when there is this thing, uh, nasalization of the arteriole and venule in the optic cup. So this is a notch here. And this is cupping occurring. Cupping is increased in the cup size. Then we did the normal optic disc, compared it with the abnormal optic disc, and then we did the this is nasalization. This is notching here. Okay, <clears throat> and then we did splinter hemorrhages, superficial splinter hemorrhage, and then we did what did we did? Is compared with the upper. Then we did papilledema, unilateral optic disc swelling is, and then papilledema is bilateral optic disc swelling, swelling with increased intracranial pressure. Then we did the normal pressure, increased pressure. When the consciousness is lost in the increased intracranial pressure, cerebral perfusion is decreased. And then we did the types of um, papilledema acute compared with the chronic in acute we have cotton relaxidates hemorrhages hyperemia all these things venous engorgement and tortuous veins blurring and a central loss of vision in acute papilledema and large blind spot but peripheral loss of vision in a chronic papilledema and then this we have these features of optic nerve blurring uh, sorry, optic cup, margins loss, blurring, elevation, hemorrhages, right? And then we did a stages in the papilledema, C-shaped, incomplete halo at a temporal site, stage one, and then complete halo on stage two with temporal site involvement. Stage three, there is partial obscuration of at least one blood vessel leaving the optic disc, and then state for complete obscuration of one blood vessel leaving the optic disc then we have dome in a state four we have dome shaped elevation of the optic disc optic nerve head so this is what we did and then we did the star macula in papilledema and then clinical features of the with tunnel regions, causes of tunnel vision. So this was a thing we did and uh, we did investigations, causes of the papilledema, vitamins causing the <coughs> papilledema, vitamin deficiency B12 causing papilledema and antibiotic tetracyclines, psychotropic medications Antipsychotic investigations of papilledema, all done, LP ultrasounds, fluorescent angiography, fundus autofluorescence, optical coherence tomography, MRI. All these investigations we did in detail. If you didn't watch it, you can go back and watch it so that in the next show, whenever we'll have. We'll see that and we saw, we, we discussed the importance of MRI over the ophthalmoscopy. All the autofluorescence we did and then we did uh, pseudopapilledema, comparing it with the papilledema that occur in AMD. And then we did pseudotumor cerebri, right? These are the three conditions, important one. And then we did the 
hypertensive retinopathy, <coughs> different stages, and also we did the vascular changes in different stages of the hypertensive retinopathy, and we did the finally we did the see this is the hypertensive retinopathy in different stages, vascular changes in hypertensive retinopathy, and then we did the diabetic retinopathy its prevention at different stages. So for now, I think we should end up, or if somebody has a question, so this is the final stage of diabetic, proliferative stage of diabetic retinopathy and its treatment, laser treatment, anti-VEGF, all this we did. So if anybody has a question, I am here for a minute and then we'll quit the this thing. So, okay then. So, let's see you next time. And I hope that we'll have more people to ask the questions in the next session. Okay.